We are now on day number 18 of 30 GIMP tutorials. This time, we are traveling in a time machine back to 1957 to style an image with a vintage finish. It's going to be groovy, so let's do it. The first thing I want to do is duplicate the image layer so we can work non-destructively. So go ahead and click right here, then double click on the layer name and change it to color to gray because we're going to convert this from color to black and white. So let's go up to colors and select hue saturation and drop the saturation down to minus 100 to get your black and white conversion. However, this is the most boring uninspiring black and white conversion known to man, at least in my humble opinion. We have a lot more options in GIMP to convert to black and white, and those options will give you more control and precision to achieve better results for your creative vision. Let's go ahead and cancel out of this, and if you want to know more about my favorite methods for converting to black and white, check out the link in the description below. One of those methods I'm going to show you right now. So let's go up to colors, desaturate, and select color to gray. So depending on your computer resources, processor speed, and RAM, the update from color to black and white, or at least the preview, is going to be very slow. As you can see, it's taking a long time to do. If it's taking too long, you can always lower the size of the image and that will help speed up the process. So we have some options here to adjust the black and white conversion based on the algorithm that GIMP is using to convert it and it's not just stripping the colors like we just did with the saturation slider. It's using different algorithms to convert based on different tonal ranges in your image and it will make them either more or less contrasty depending on the settings. You can also increase or decrease the amount of grain as well. So let me show you how this works. So since we're doing a vintage edit, I want to lower the contrast a little bit. So we're going to increase the radius to a lot. So something like that. And once the preview updates, you will notice that the image is flatter. Samples is going to pretty much do the same thing. It's just going to make it more flat versus where it's currently at now. So I'm going to go ahead and increase this to 14. And then iterations is going to control the amount of grain. So 10 is the default. And if you want to add more grain, you're going to lower the number of iterations. If you want less grain, you're going to increase it. So I'm going to drop this down to around two. And at this point, it's kind of hard to see the grain even once the preview is updated. So we need to increase the contrast of the black points or the shadows to enhance the visibility of the grain. So I'm gonna click on Enhance Shadows and you can now see as the preview updates, that grain is a lot easier to see. So that's the effect I want for my color to black and white conversion. So let's go ahead and click OK. So again, it's just gonna take a couple minutes here for the color to gray conversion to be completed. The next thing I wanna do is I wanna fade out the shadows and the black point to make those blacks and gray brighter or flatter to give it that faded look, which is typical of old vintage prints, especially when those prints are subjected to sunlight for long periods of time, you'll find that those types of images end up having a more faded look. So let's go ahead and duplicate this layer again and name it Faded. And the tool that I'm going to use is one of my favorites. It's called Curves. So we're going to go up to Colors and click on Curves here. And Curves is going to give you the opportunity to adjust the tonal ranges in your image as well as adjusting the individual color channels. So I do have another tutorial that we created a retro style edit to where we altered the different color channels to create the retro effect. So you may want to check out that video tutorial next. For now, we're just going to focus on the tonal ranges and you can see a histogram in the back here, which is basically the histogram of this image. So we have our shadows on the left, our midtones in the middle and our highlights on the right. This little button right here, or this little circle, is the white point, and down here we have the black point. 
So we can alter the tones in our image based on how we manipulate this linear line. So I want to target my edit to the shadows and the black point. So I'm going to click right here to add an anchor point. And just so you know, in case you've never used curves before, if you click and drag this up, it's going to make the image brighter. Down, it's going to make it darker. So I want to leave this anchor point right here in the center so that the edit is targeted in this tonal range right here, which is shadows to a part of the midtones. So we can narrow down the tonal range even further by adding another anchor point right here if you wanted to or further down depending on how far you want to narrow that down to. So now to target the shadows we're going to click here and drag up to brighten up the shadows in that part of the tonal range. So the higher I go the brighter those shadows become. I don't want to go too far otherwise it's going to start muddying up the shadows and it's not going to look very good. So you can see I'm targeting this tonal range based on the bending of the curve here. And if these anchor points weren't here, then I'd be adjusting the tonal range in the midtones and the highlights as well. I also want to brighten up the black point, which is the point in the image or the points or the pixels in the image that are pure black. I don't want any pure black in my image. So I'm going to increase the brightness level or change the black value to a light or a darker gray color by increasing this higher. And again, the higher you go, the brighter those black points become. I don't want to go too high again because I don't want that black point to be muddied. So something like that, once we click on the preview here, we can see the before and after. And you can see in the darker areas, it's much lighter than it was before, which is the effect I want for this vintage style edit. Let's go ahead and click OK. And the next thing we need to do is we need to add our images. So I have my three files here. So these are the same files that I've included in the link in the description below. So if you want to use the same ones, I'm using 01 for the dust spots and the dirt. I'm using the textured file from John Saylor and texture seven for the scratches. So I'm gonna click and drag these over my document and then they're going to automatically open up in GIMP as new layers. So it looks like this layer here is smaller than our canvas. So I wanna make it larger so it fills up the entire canvas. Otherwise it's going to look kind of weird with the scratches just stopping in this area here. So let's grab our scale tool with shift plus S and that will automatically turn on the scale tool and we can see the width right here is 5,000 by 3,000 and the actual image size I think is around 5,800 to 6,000 pixels wide. So I'm going to go ahead and type in 6,000 here and hit my tab key and because I have this turned on right here it's linking the two together and it will automatically adjust the height and keep that image layer in the current aspect ratio. I'm going to go ahead and click in the center here and move it into position and it looks like it's not tall enough yet so I'm going to click on the bottom here and drag down. We can go ahead and click enter or return once we're happy with the size and then that will resize the layer for us. I'm going to grab my zoom tool with the letter Z. I'm going to hold down my control key or my command key if I'm on a Mac and click once to zoom out and now we can see this layer boundary for the layer is outside of the canvas which is what we want. I'm going to go ahead and click on my texture layer here and the layer boundary for that one is larger as well. And let's check our dust spots here and it looks like the layer size is smaller than our canvas. So let's grab shift plus S again to activate the scale tool and then go ahead and increase it larger than the canvas. Okay, enter or return. All right, I'm going to hold down my control key, then my shift key. And then the letter J, if you're on a Mac, it's Command Shift J. And that will bring the image back up to the size of the interface so it fits inside of it. I'm going to go ahead and turn off these top two layers here so I can take a look at my dust and dirt layer here and take a look at if I need to make any adjustments. So we have a little bit of a large dust spot right here on our lips, which is kind of distracting. So we can increase the size of the layer to move it or we can use a layer mask 
to remove that part of the overlay on the image. So let's go ahead and add a layer mask and fix it. And we're going to select white and then click add and nothing happened yet. And that's because white adds and black removes. So what does that mean? Well, when you paint on a layer mask with black, it will then remove the pixel values or the edits applied on that layer. Let's grab our zoom tool with the letter Z. I'm going to click and drag around the lips here to zoom in. And then I'm going to grab my paint brush tool with the letter P. And we need to make sure that our foreground color here is set to black so we can paint with black. Now, because I have my layer mask selected in the layer, when I paint on the canvas, it's going to apply that paint on the layer mask and then it will remove the dust and the dirt that I paint over. So I'm just going to paint right here. And as you can see, it's starting to remove those dust spots. How cool is that? I love it. Now, the one thing you want to make sure is in your tool options here that you have opacity set to 100 and that will fully remove whatever you paint on. If the opacity is set to a lower amount, you're essentially painting with a gray color instead of full 100% black. And that's going to gradually remove that edit or those pixel values versus removing it all at once. Let's go ahead and zoom out again with Control Shift and J. And I think the dust spots as they are right now look pretty good. We may come back and adjust them again later on. It all depends on how these other two layers affect our image. So let's go ahead and turn on our texture layer here and make sure you select it because what we want to do is change the blending mode to blend in with the layers below so we can actually see our main subject. So we're going to come up here to mode and select soft light. I'm not sure I like that, so I'm going to come back up to mode and select multiply, which is going to make it darker, which is too intense now. But I do like how the different textures and the creases and the scratches in it are coming through more now. But I do want to tone it down a little bit by dropping the opacity down to around 38 to 40, so something like that. Let's go ahead and turn on our overlay texture here, select it, and we're also going to apply the multiply blend mode for that as well. And it doesn't really help with seeing the image below. So we're going to drop the opacity way down here to right around nine. So that looks pretty good if you ask me. The next thing I want to do is add a sepia tone to the image to help enhance the vintage style. So let's add a new layer by clicking right here. We're going to call it sepia tone. And I want to set the fill width to the foreground color, which I'm going to choose right now. So let's come over here, click on this box right here, and then choose any color you want. I'm going to use this orange color here. If you want to use the same color, type in this hexadecimal number, click OK. Click OK again, and then it fills it in with that color. Let's change the blending mode to overlay. And we now have our sepia tone, but it's a little bit too bright for me. So I'm going to go ahead and drop the opacity down to, I think right about there looks pretty good. What do you think? I think I'm going to go with that. The next thing I want to do is add a vignette. So let's go ahead and create a new layer again. Let's call it vignette. And then for fill width, we're going to set that to transparency. Go ahead and click OK. Let's go up to filters, light and shadow and vignette. So we have a lot of options here and I've gone into great detail about all of these options in another tutorial that explains a lot of information about vignettes. We're just going to go through this real quick so we can go ahead and finish up this project. If you want to find out that tutorial, I have the link for that in the description below. If we come over here and click on on canvas controls, you're going to see all these ovals and circles. And this will allow you to make changes to your vignette directly from here versus the sliders over here. The one thing I want to do is I want to lower the opacity because it's too dark in the corners right now. So if I come down here, I can adjust the opacity from here. And then I'm going to turn off the on canvas controls and take a look at the before and after here to see if that's what I like. I think I'm going to drop the opacity down a little bit more. I don't want the vignette to be as 
prominent. I just want something subtle to enhance the image. Let's go ahead and turn on our on canvas controls again, because I do want to change the feathering of the gradient or the softness of the edge. And I can do that by clicking and dragging this oval in, and that's going to increase the size of the feathering. I'm finding that the image is a little bit too bright for my taste. So I'm going to grab my texture layer here and I think I need to increase the opacity some to make it a little bit darker and to make those scratches much more visible. Before you go, make sure you check out that playlist to your left to learn more about editing, retouching, and styling your images in GIMP. Thanks for listening and have an awesome day.